we wanted to have more than one thing in our pocket. That we didn't just want to do an Elder Scrolls and an Elder Scrolls and an Elder Scrolls. We knew we wanted to be in a similar vein in terms of we wanted open world, we wanted, you know, kind of role playing elements and things like this. And we made a list of things that we, we might want to do. At the top of the list was Fallout. Fallout 1 to me is like the pinnacle of the post-apocalyptic gameplay and, and looking at the story and the characters in there were really inspiring. We felt in that world and the systems they have in Fallout 1, coupled with the way we put things together, we sort of became obsessed, like, th this is the game, we have to make this game. A bunch of the people who run the company knew the people at Interplay. We, we pestered them and pestered them, like, are you guys using Fallout? They weren't doing anything with it. Can we do something? And eventually they said yes. It's now ours, and we have always taken the approach that Fallout 3 is being made as if we made the first two. Well, that means we do what we do, which is we reinvent, we look at what works, what didn't, we're not afraid to make changes, we're not afraid to try new things, and we're gonna try and sort of move the genre forward and move gaming forward. Our game is set 30-some years after the events of Fallout 2, so we didn't want to step on their fiction, but the story itself is something that we came up with based on the themes of the original Fallout. It's 30 years after the events of Fall 2, but it's 200 years after the, the original atomic holocaust. So in, in, our, in our game, things have actually gotten worse. You know, society hasn't progressed. You know, humanity is struggling to survive. There's radiation sickness and people don't have fresh, clean water and like, people are pretty well screwed. You leave the safety of your vault into this world, you know, it's your big decision. Am I gonna help these people or am I gonna, you know, do my own thing and serve my own selfish needs? We felt we needed to do something new with role playing and guns that we couldn't just do a pure first person shooter thing. So how can we kind of bridge that gap between what my character can do that I've made in the game and what I, the player, can do? Something we always wrestle with. Our game is primarily first person. So when you have guns in first person, the bar has been raised. You know, you've got Halo 3, Call of Duty 4, you get to approach that level, but it's tough because we're an, we're an RPG, not a shooter. What we definitely wanted to do with the gun stuff is not do everything that everyone else has done. So, you know, we have some weapons that you can craft and some unique weapons, you know, like the rocket launcher that shoots all the crap you find in the world. You can shoot it as projectiles. One of the things we realized is with Oblivion, most of the combat is melee combat. So everybody's, you know, charging you in, in up close and personal. Not so with guns. People stay back, they take cover. We've really had to compensate for that. What we're doing technically with Fallout 3, we're drawing twice as much stuff on the screen and faster, right? So our actual ability to put things on the screen and have them look cool or be cool or do more with characters, explosions, whatever we want, it's, you know, a large factor above Oblivion. Our, our problem is we can't stop ourselves. Uh, Fallout's one of those examples of the game, when we started, was about half the size. I look at the game overall and it's remarkably similar to, you know, what we had envisioned. There are some really big plot points that changed for the better. You emerge from these vaults and you don't know what's happened. So it's the optimism of this retro 50s world and it's all destroyed. That people are still getting on. They're still trying to do their hair right and if they had hairspray, they'd use it. It's like, you know what, don't look at the destroyed crater and the smoking thing behind me. It's all cool, we're cool, we'll have some cigars and martinis later. You just managed to get yourself into all sorts of trouble, don't you? That's what I love about Fallout. It doesn't take itself too seriously because the reality is so frightening and so depressing. It feels like you leave that vault and the only thing you take with you is this piece of technology strapped to your wrist that becomes your sort of lifeline. It's that immersion thing, it's keeping you in the game. We're big believers in immersion because ultimately our goal is we want to see productivity decline. We want sick days to go up. We want people staying up until five o'clock in the morning because they had no idea what time it was and they just had to do that one more quest and they have to get up for work in an hour. I think one of the things that we try to do really well are the worlds that are very, very realized. So for the moments you're in them, the amount of times you say, I wonder if I can, oh, I can. I wonder if I can, oh, I can. It gives you a level of attachment you know, to the person you're playing in the game. Fallout is just such a unique 
wonderful world to explore. I think it fits the kind of games we make perfectly. It's, it's an open-ended environment, lots of characters, really interesting game systems. If you can make whatever the repetitive action is really entertaining, like that's where the rubber meets the road in a lot of these games. So this is something I know the player's gonna do a thousand times. Make that as entertaining as you can, and the rest of it is pretty much great. We had the story written, and, and we had the outlines for all the quests, but then, you know, we have a lot of talented designers here, we wanted to pass that stuff on to them, so they would be given the rough outlines of these, you know, miscellaneous quests, or, and then they would have the freedom to flesh those out themselves. Ah, welcome, weary traveler. You look like a traveler in need of relaxation and the finest of chemical assistance. Design is an iterative process. You need to leave room to change as you go. So having a design doc that thick at the, at the outset is actually not that healthy. I think we did a much better job this time around than we did in Oblivion. We had builds of the game, and we actually themed those builds according to the things we wanted to see in the game. So we had a, a combat build, a creature build. We had a build that was just called Guns. And all the build was about was shooting guns. Like, how do they feel in your hand? And so there was no, it must do this, it must do this, it must do this. It's just about guns. And that kind of will get us on a path of something that is just a lot more fun. We can sit in a meeting for hours and debate, you know, the pluses and minuses of it. And then we'll put it in the game, and in 30 seconds, anybody watching this would go, this is terrible. <laughs> or, great. You don't have to, sometimes you just overthink it. So we try to force ourselves more to put it in the game and play with it as soon as possible. And you just know instantly. There have certainly been first person RPGs that have had guns before, but I think it's been a while since PC players have had a game like that. On the console side, I think people have been wanting something like that for a long time, you know? Give me a game that has the gunplay of Gears of War or Call of Duty with the depth of an open world RPG. And I hope that eventually, someday, maybe many years from now, that we are just as well known for Fallout as the Elder Scrolls, because right now they are both our, our children. It is so different. It's this weird, like, Tomorrowland gone awry. And that in itself is, is, is gold for someone like me to come in and try to, you know, help create that world. So it's pure escapist entertainment. It's crazy, and you, you try not to get wrapped up on the seriousness of it. There are moments where you, you think about it and you wonder if you're being irresponsible. The good news is the people the game is for get it, but sometimes you talk to people, you know, I'm the worst person at a cocktail party. I mean, you go and they say, oh, what do you do? It's like, I make video games. What kind? The kind where you shoot people? Yeah, kind of. Are they really violent? Like, where's the set? In DC? Oh, that's cute. Yeah, it's all blown up. And then they, they just turn around, they don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> like, that guy's sick. It's the signature of a Bethesda Game Studio game is you're going to have a big open-ended world you're going to be able to walk anywhere you want. If you see something in the distance, you're going to be able to walk to it, and you're going to be able to open it up, and you're going to find lots of cool stuff there. We've gotten better with our animation stuff, is, is leagues above what it was in Oblivion. Our portrayal of characters as realistic people, I think we've gone above and beyond. It's a big world out there, honey, full of all sorts of people. What about you? What sort of person are you going to be? It's very, very interesting that there's a group of people who have hope for what's left of humanity. It's a very compelling story, and the young hero or heroine of it has to go through a series of, of tests, both ethical and moral, as well as physical, and I, I, I think it's very, very good. Despite the destruction, and despite like how depressing some of the scenes may be, they're, they're a pure charm, and some of those are like violence done in ridiculous manner. <laughs> And some of those are a line somebody says. Moriarty pisses in his still. Crazy bastard thinks it's hilarious. There are very few ideas that you can't put into a Fallout game. You know, something else that's more serious fantasy, you'd say, eh, wrong flavor. But here, you know, you can have a robot that goes around asking for friends and cutting their heads off, or, you know, anything you want to do. Being private and publishing our own stuff lets us take risks that a lot of people can't. We're in a pretty fortunate position of having the time and the creative freedom to do games like this. We sort of feel like we like it a lot, and if we execute it well, it, it'll find an audience that it makes us enough money to do the next game. You have a smaller group of people, they tend to, they tend to cling to each other a little more tightly. We tend to believe in each other a little more. 
um, you know, sort of the idea that it's us against the world. No other help is coming. If we're going to get it done, it's going to be the folks here. And when I started in 99, it was, it was a little group of folks. You know, the development team was 10, 12 guys. It was Todd and his small little band working away on Morrowind then. Even though we've grown and gotten a lot bigger, I don't think we've lost that feeling. I think that there are enough of us from those days, and, and just about everybody from that first team is still here. So was playing and did the Megaton quest, and it was priceless. He just hit the switch, and you see the mushroom cloud in the background. He just sort of sat back in his chair, and he with this big smile on his face. And then he checked his pit boy to check his karma. It said evil. I said, yep, that'll do it. That's a, a pretty big element in the game. When you do something evil, we try to make it very visually entertaining. And then the game tells you, you've lost karma. You're a bad person. That was a lot of the reason we wanted to make it. But it was, oh, this is just so cool. And the pushback that I would get, that's like 10 years old. I'm like, cool is cool forever, man. This is going to be cool 50 years from now. In terms of our design of Fallout 3, we had several goals. Um, one of them was to be true to the original games and to sort of, you know, look at those to inspiration, but at the same time updated to various standards as far as the technology goes, and also just kind of inject a lot more realism and detail that you expect in a primarily first-person game. But as far as the aesthetics go, it definitely was a challenge in terms of creating a huge, destroyed, devastated world that was still pretty, to explore and, and felt like the DC area. I try to draw what I see in my head and the part that I see the clearest I tend to draw first. So I try to make things very story driven and that'll help me when I'm really, really stumped. I'll say, all right, what do I see in my head? And all right, if we got Ward Cleaver and he's kind of scared, but you know, he found some whiskey and a shotgun. All right, you know, things start to coagulate, and I think a lot of times these characters and situations are really, for me, they're found. And I feel like I'm documenting something that I found, and if it's unclear, it's because, well, I haven't quite found it yet. In terms of the art specifically, you know, we're kind of given a lot of liberty to sort of decide how we want to reinterpret the game, because there, there's really so much you can do. You know, jumping up from 64 by 64 pixel sprites to, to full screen things. So a lot of it was just based on instinct in terms of the artist. And, you know, if we're going to redesign a certain character, if we were going to, like, take Mr. Handy and what's the new Mr. Handy going to look like? It's like, you know, we wanted a connection there, but at the same time, I'm going to do something new and take it in a new direction, give it, kind of give it a new spin just to make it feel a little more fresh. I have an interest in all things 50s because I think there's a certain charisma with the music, with the automobiles, with the clothing style, um, uh, the sort of jet set Frank Sinatra rat pack in a flying car with a martini in one hand and he's going to a big band concert. Uh, there's something that's always fun about that. And so designing any of these characters and then throwing them into the wasteland, uh, the dark humor kicked in for me when I imagined Ward Cleaver being pushed out of his bunker and now he's in the wasteland and he's looking for you know, fresh tobacco for his pipe, and here comes a raider over the, you know, the top of the horizon. What better kind of thing to draw do you have? I mean, that's a comic book in itself. In the game design, there's an underlying tone of humor which is appropriate for the franchise, for Fallout. It's definitely a staple of it. How we reflect that in the artwork is also is more subtle, but there are little things that, for example, we were trying to come up with a list of, all right, what sort of objects and clutter items can we use in our urban landscape in, in DC just to, to fill it up, to clutter it up. And our concept artist Adam came up with, he did a sketch of like a coin operated fallout shelter. It's just like a little steel tube that if you put 50 cents in, go in, close yourself in, you're in a little one person fallout shelter in case the bombs happen to drop when you're out shopping and you know in downtown or something like that. And it's, it's a ridiculous idea, but it's thematically very appropriate for sort of like the culture of the time period the uh, 1950s kind of naivete that we were trying to achieve. 